Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Total Synthesis episode, we'll go through the recent asymmetric total synthesis of Haper 4NG by the group of Jiawa Chen and Cheng Yang at Peking University. Let's dive right in. Aside from its astonishing level of complexity, the target also possesses desirable biological activity in that it's a potent inhibitor of human 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, which is an enzyme that controls the level of cortisol in cells. Applications stemming from inhibition of this enzyme with small molecules have been explored in the perspective in JMedChem at the bottom. In the retrosynthetic analysis of this target, the authors imagined using two initial disconnections, a conjugate addition, and an aldol condensation in order to retrosynthetically cut the final target into two pieces and allow a convergent approach. The intermediate on the left, which we'll look at first, contains an epoxide that the authors imagined accessing through a Veit-Scheffer epoxidation, as well as a lactone, which the authors thought might arise from a diol using the Lay oxidation. Going back further, the authors proposed that the cyclopentenone present in this intermediate might be accessible using an intramolecular paulson kahn reaction on an acyclic enine starting material, where these are the fragments that would need to be connected in the forward direction to form the cyclopentenone moiety. The E9 intermediate was traced back retrosynthetically to this type of lactone, which the authors thought might be feasible if two methyl groups could be installed on the left using a double Grignard reaction, while the terminal alkene might be formed by oxidation and subsequent olefination of an alcohol motif. The alkene present in this lactone intermediate was viewed as the product of a ring-closing metathesis, which had come about starting from this type of acyclic precursor, where the authors proposed installation of the propargyl group by an asymmetric alkylation reaction. On the other hand, the furanyl lactone intermediate they would need as a late-stage coupling partner might be seen as the product of a palladium-catalyzed iodine atom transfer reaction. Looking to simplify further, the authors thought about using an asymmetric addition of an organo-zinc in combination with an appropriate aldehyde electrophile. So these are the main lines of retrosynthetic analysis the authors presented for this complex target. Let's check out how they were able to implement them in the forward synthesis. The first step in the synthesis is an asymmetric alkylation of a carboxylic acid using the chiral tetraamine pioneered by the Zakarian group. This alkylation provided the enantiene-enriched alpha-propargylated carboxylic acid as the major product, although a small amount of the gamma-alkylated products were formed as well. On the basis of mechanistic work by the Zakarian group, a stereochemical model for the chiral mixed aggregate was proposed, where the tetramine coordinates to lithium ions that hold the ene diolate as shown, leaving only the face of the ene diolate opposite the aggregate exposed. As an important practical consideration, 89% of the tetramine could be recovered after the reaction. An alternative approach, which was also asymmetric, was explored using an oxazolidinone or Evans chiral auxiliary. In this first step, they installed the chiral auxiliary on an appropriate acyl chloride. Then, they treated it with sodium HMDS and a propergelic electrophile to arrive at this product, although the alkylation was not as high yielding as the approach with the tetramine above. Finally, they removed the chiral auxiliary with lithium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide, which provided the same enantiene-rich building block. It's very important in total synthesis for the purpose of throughput as well as HPLC analysis to have a robust racemic route, even if the final aim is an asymmetric route. To achieve this step in a racemic sense, the authors started from a terbutyl ester and carried out an alpha propargylation using just lithium HMDS and an appropriate electrophile. Subsequently, they removed the terbutyl group using TMS triflate and lutidine. Going back to the asymmetric route, the authors carried on their enantiene-enriched carboxylic acid intermediate and used a DCC coupling to install this chiral sidechain. As a side note, this sidechain was accessed using a falk miaskowski methylination on an enantiene-rich terminal epoxide, where the epoxide could be opened with a sulfur illid nucleophile, which subsequently underwent an elimination to form the terminal alkene. Using this strategy, it was possible to rely on glycidol as a source of commercial chirality for this piece. Having installed the allylic alcohol fragment, they utilized the terminal alkene immediately in a ring-closing metathesis using Grubb's second-generation metathesis catalyst. And now, having arrived at one of the key intermediates proposed in the retrosynthetic analysis, the authors carried out a double Grignard addition using methyl magnesium bromide, followed by treatment with TBAF to remove the TIPS groups. Then the authors proceeded with installation of appropriate protecting groups before proceeding, first via TBS protection of the primary alcohol, and subsequently via TMS protection of the alkyne. The Lay oxidation converted the secondary alcohol into a ketone, which was used directly in a Wittig reaction to install the 1,1-di-substituted alkene that the authors would need in the next step. Having reached this E9, the authors employed a catalytic paulson kahn reaction to form the cyclopentenone product shown. This presumably occurred by reaction of the dicobalt octocarbonyl with the alkyne to form a tetrahedral intermediate, which underwent an alkene coordination and insertion event. 
followed by a CO insertion to install the carbonyl group, and finally a ring closure to form the cyclopentenone, after which a TBAFD protection removed the silo groups. Here it's worth noting that the new stereo center in the product was formed with excellent diastereo selectivity. Moving on, the authors carried out a nucleophilic Veit-Scheffer epoxidation to arrive at this intermediate, which I'll draw in a more 3D way to see the next step more clearly. Applying the lay oxidation again, the authors were now able to set up the desired lactone. Then, seeking to carry out an alpha methylation on the ketone, the authors used KHMDS and iodomethane, which delivered a small amount of the O-alkylated product in addition to the desired product. However, as the objective was ultimately not to install a methyl group, but rather to set up an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone for conjugate addition chemistry, they proceeded by installing a phenylselenide motif, and subsequently used hydrogen peroxide to carry out a selenoxide elimination. Here, reflecting on the author's retrosynthetic plan once more, we can see how they had successfully made the coupling partner on the left, but the furanyl lactone on the right still needed to be made in order to complete the synthesis. To access this fragment, the authors carried out an asymmetric propenylation on three furan carboxaldehyde using diethyl zinc and catalytic MIB, which is a chiral amino alcohol developed by Nugent for this type of transformation, which in turn took inspiration from Nayori's chiral amino alcohol, DAIB. Having formed the secondary alcohol in a highly enantiomer-rich fashion, the authors carried out an NIS-promoted acetal formation with thirbutyl vinyl ether. Now they were ready to carry out a palladium-catalyzed carboiodination, which resulted in ring closure to give this product bearing a new all-carbon quaternary stereocenter. The acetal diastereomers could then be converged using Jones reagent to oxidize up to the lactone. After that relatively short sequence, the authors were then ready to pursue intermolecular coupling of their two fragments. To do that, they turned to photoredox catalysis and were able to use an iridium photocatalyst in combination with Hanch ester to enable the intermolecular coupling. This is presumably operating by generation of a primary alkyl radical via single electron reduction using an excited state iridium-3 species. The resulting iridium-4 can then be turned over to regenerate the catalyst using Hanch ester, or the amine base DIPEA as well, as a single electron donor, which also generates a cation radical intermediate that we'll come back to in a second. The primary alkyl radical we generated before can then engage in a radical conjugate addition with the enone species in order to generate the tertiary radical at the carbon marked in purple. Finally, using the Hanch ester derived cation radical to perform a hydrogen atom transfer, we can generate the desired product with over 20 to 1 diastere selectivity with concomitant formation of a pyridine byproduct. Additionally, the epoxide moiety present in the starting material was found open in the course of the reaction, resulting in a tertiary alcohol in the product. The authors continued by using potassium terbutoxide to carry out a diastere selective aldol addition. Then, in order to eliminate the newly formed tertiary alcohol, the authors tied up the two tertiary alcohols as a cyclic sulfate using thionyl chloride and treated it with DBU to form haperforin G, where this is the proton that needed to be deprotonated to do that final elimination and complete the synthesis. This was really a massive synthetic effort that reached into multiple areas of organic synthesis to approach an extremely challenging target. And we'll end it there for today. Thank you for joining us for another Total Synthesis episode. If you enjoyed it, please support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Check out our website, synthesis-workshop.com, and follow us on Twitter to stay up to date. See you all next time.